cannot tell you how excited we are that after all these months of putting this together, we're here. Greece is the word. <laughs> and it has just become this massive event today. We have events going on all the way through the country um, for, a, for about a week, in fact. And um, we are going today, we're going to be hearing media, we're going to be hearing cabaret, comedy, lots of literature, of course, poetry, fiction. And we had probably about 100 performers on our long list, and I've had to narrow it down to quite a few, well, as many as I could possibly squeeze into this afternoon and evening. I now want to introduce you to a few very, very special people. I feel they're my friends. We've gone through a lot together. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Katerina Iliopoulou, Victoria Hislop, Katerina Vrana and Bethany Hughes. You may know them, <laughs> some of them. Um, Katerina Iliopoulou over there is, is one of Greece's most famous poets. I'm so pleased to have you here. And Katerina, you're going to be doing an event about... Yes, hello. I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. Um, and I will be sharing with you uh, contemporary Greek poetry in Greek and in English, uh, together with the poets Vasilis Amanatidis and Dionysis Kapsalis. More than anything, it is a crisis of, of values and, uh, and ideas. And I think that uh, maybe in this situation, we have to think um, what, what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of politics we want to have, because um, what dominates our lives at the moment is, uh, is, is one single narrative, and that is economics. You know, we, mu we must not accept to, to our lives to be reduced in numbers, but because whoever is, is ready to accept this, uh, that his life is just a citation of, of practical uh, numbers, is ready to accept uh, Abisma Horo once again. Katharina was here for uh, the poetry Parnassus last year, so you might have, might have seen and heard her then. Victoria Hislop, without Victoria, this event also would not have happened. She and, I start, she and I met a couple of years ago and she shared her passion and love of Greece with me and it's really infected me. I'm now Greek. Mm -hmm. I think I'm Greek. <laughs> Victoria, as you know, has written um, two novels based in Greece. She is a superstar in Greece, um, as you probably know. And uh, Victoria is going to be leading us through two events today. Um, we're going to touch briefly on the life of writers in Greece today, the problems, the issues, but more positively on how, um, how they write, what they write about, and hopefully be introducing um, English readers to their work. There's one thing I wanted to ask, although it's quite difficult in the dark because I'm really curious. I'm going to ask not the English to put up their hands, but the Greeks, because I would, was wanting to know what our split mm. was. So you're all Greek. Oh, there are a few <laughs> Greeks. You're all Greek. Well, this is, this is wonderful. Actually, I will ask the English to put up their hands. Are, are, are you oh, out there? <laughs> bravo. <laughs> Well, that's welcome. Kalos yeah. <laughs> Oris Day to all the Greeks. Um, we started discussing fairly early on what the content should be, and it was always clear that we should have literature, poetry, music, because they thrive in Greece. And then I said we really must have a, a media um, discussion as well, because you couldn't talk about Greece without sort of bringing in the sort of different um, political events that were happening. Um, and then of course Katerina Varana, who I'd seen for the first time in Thessaloniki when I was there to do a TED talk um, about 18 months ago, and I'd said, we have to have this amazing Greek stand-up comedian. Um, She's a, an actress, she is the most incredibly funny, witty, clever, Brilliant woman. Have I, is that enough of a build-up? That's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Really Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katerina. I'm amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to be hosting uh, the uh, Crisis Cabaret this evening, uh, which is going to kind of wrap up everything that's happened throughout the day. So um, there's going to be me, uh, Victoria's going to do some poetry. There's going to be some amazing Greek music. I'm so excited. We've got Musutu, which is um, a Greek collective of musicians who uh, work in London, and they're amazing. Um, we've also got David Prudhomme, who's going to do some live graphic drawing to uh, Rebetiko music. Um, 
it's and then we're going to finish with um, a surprise. Ha! Um, <laughs> so you know, strap in. Uh, so I'm hoping it's going to be really amazing. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the conclusion of the evening. Um, I think I. May I mention what we're wearing? Oh, um, please. Yes. yes. Oh, hi, guys. Do you so, think anyway. I didn't get noticed. <laughs> so, um, the Greek design America Transos very kindly offered to lend us dresses for today. So, ta da. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We're Greek to the core today. <laughs> Greek, Greek. My mom described it to her friend. said, You know, my daughter, she does a monologue and it's funny. And that doesn't quite. I mean, it does, but it doesn't quite describe stand-up. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's um, it's about 12 or 13 comedians in Greece at the moment. And what are you doing right now? I'm straightening my hair okay. for tonight. Uh, we've greeked it up as much as we could. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I'm going to hand you over to the first event of the day. Bethany Hughes, one and only, on Helen of Troy. Thank you Enjoy. so much. Can I just, before I, before I talk about Helen of Troy, I just want to quite say a very quick thank you to Rosie and to everybody involved for organising this, because it is the most extraordinary opportunity for us. I am constantly asked by journalists, why is Greece relevant, both ancient and modern? And I do feel like saying, how long have you got? The <laughs> fact that if we're speaking in English, probably between 40 and 60% of our words will be of Greco-Roman origin. The fact that all the hot spots of human history, Greece, Egypt, the Middle East, the Eastern Mediterranean, all live under boundaries developed by Greek civilizations. And, and of course, the brilliant Melina Mercuri quote when she was asked to address an international audience and she stood up and said I apologize I just want to speak a few words of Greek democracy theater mathematics philosophy <laughs> so Greece is entirely relevant to everything we do and I think what's so special and brilliant about the Greeks both ancient and modern is that it seems to me that Greece understands the power of stories of histories and of myth and I think that's today what we're going to be looking at is the separation between fact and fiction, what is true about Greece, both in the past and in the present. And kudos, good Greek word, to all of you for being here. Um, some of you may know I've written a book about Socrates, and for Socrates, the good life was sitting together face to face and debating what it is to be human. So wherever Socrates is now, I think he's looking down on you and thinking you, the audience, are the incarnation of the good life. So thank you to you for coming too. Uh, Greece has suffered terribly over the last few years and it's suffered, I would say, directly as a result of the greed of a few people uh, and a misunderstanding actually of what it is to, to be Greek. Uh, when I travel through, it breaks my heart sometimes to see what people are dealing with. But you know what I also think as a historian, having studied um, the history of Greece, both ancient and modern, it seems to me that there's a characteristic of the Greeks which is to be sturdy and resilient, a warmth, the generosity, uh, a belief in the important things of life that is all wrapped up in what it is to be Greek. Um, so anything that we can do to celebrate that, to celebrate the, the culture of modern Greece, as well as referring to the glory of the ancient world is a good thing in my book. So there is a lot to get through today, so very, very briefly then, I am going to kick off with a, with a swift whistle-stop tour of the world of Helen and Homer, because we thought it would make sense chronologically, again, another good de Greek-derived word, uh, to start at the beginning, to start with one of the oldest and arguably the, the very greatest works of literature that we have, the epic cycle that generates both the Iliad and the Odyssey, and Helen's place in particular within that. Um, as you'll have noticed on the stage, we had quite a preponderance of X chromosomes. There were quite a lot of women there. Um, my experience of Greek women, both ancient and modern, is that they are quite feisty creatures. Um, I always think if you spend time with a Greek woman of a certain age with a mobile phone and a good address book basically there is nothing that she cannot do um, uh, and the same I think applies really to the idea of Helen who has traveled down the centuries to us today um, 
because there is an extraordinary thing about Helen of Troy that she first enters the written record 28 centuries ago and yet there isn't a single decade in human history between then and now where Helen leads, leaves the, the radar. She is constantly debated about, talked about, painted, written about in poems and plays. And that says something both about the power of Homer's story and Homer's words, but also something bigger about the power of Hellenism, the fact that Helen Hellenism has been a touchstone, really, for both Eastern and Western civilizations over the last 28 centuries, and I would argue beyond that. Um, so very quickly, just before I start talking about Helen, I just wanted to share a very, very brief anecdote with you. Um, I, I wrote a book about Helen of Troy, and after that, we made a television program about her. And as we were preparing to do this, uh, the producer said, OK, great, Helen of Troy, the Trojan War, fantastic, lots of sex and violence, television loves that, really good. But the only problem is, you know, it's based in the Bronze Age, and all the archaeological remains of the Bronze Age, they're a bit static, aren't they? Those stones, not much movement there. I want to put a bit of movement into this show. What I want to do, and, and uh, uh, he had done a bit of homework, he said, I think it'd be really interesting, because I know there are amazing representations Presentations of Greek style Bronze Age chariots and also Eastern Hittite style Bronze Age chariots. So I think we should recreate these chariots and recreate the Trojan War on the plains of Troy. Um, and as he was saying this, I felt my heart sink, um, knowing that he had previously produced a, a British television children's program called Blue Peter. Um, and I could just see all my academic credentials kind of, you know, wilting onto the floor. Um, and then I thought, oh, well, OK, well, maybe he's got a point, though. Maybe this would be a way of making this accessible. So, that, right, we will do this. We will recreate the Trojan War. But on the strict understanding that we do this as an archaeological experiment. So we, we do know what these chariots look like. So let's recreate them with absolute purity so that we rebuild them just using the materials that we use. So this, this was the deal. So we did this. We built our Hittite-style eastern chariots, which were big, chunky things, and our Greek-style Bronze Age chariots, which, interestingly, were a little bit like kind of rather gorgeous sports cars, we realised, once we'd recreated them. Very elegant, um, very light, so light that I could actually lift one up by myself, which was interesting for us historically, because that made us think, gosh, well, maybe... Maybe those Greeks did put chariots on boats and sail them across the Aegean and the Mediterranean uh, to Troy. Maybe that was a possibility. So we had these beautiful chariots made, shipped them out to Turkey. And on the morning of the shoot, five o'clock in the morning, there was this hammering, frantic hammering on my door. And it was the producer. I'm just about to swear, so do forgive me. He said, Bethany, Bethany, you've got to wake up. I've forgotten to book any bloody horses. So... Um, <laughs> There we were with these very expensive, beautifully made, archaeologically accurate Bronze Age chariots and no horses to pull them. So I looked at him kind of through narrowed eyes and said, you, my dear, have got to sort this out. And luckily, um, I was sharing the room with our assistant producer, who was a Greek specialist and a classicist, so therefore eminently intelligent. Um, and she said, oh, I've spotted there are some uh, gypsies down on what were once the plains of Troy. I don't know how many of you have been to the Trojan site. Some people can't bear to go to it, I know Greeks. Well, you'll know that there's this kind of flat plain uh, which is now farmed. The sea used to come much further up and now it's used to grow tomatoes and cotton. And year in, year out, these migrant groups of, of uh, gypsies come from the Turkish-Iranian border and, and farm there. Anyway, so the classicists said, where there are gypsies, there are horses. I will go down and see if I can borrow their horses for our chariot. So she beetled off, went down. Being good Romanists, of course, they haggled hard. And uh, I think we ended up with the most expensive horses ever used in any film production because we were desperate. These, you have to understand, are these clapped-out old nags used to pulling um, uh, carts of cotton and tomatoes. And I think we paid 2,500 euros per horse uh, to, to strap them. Anyway, it's bad memory. Um, uh, but, but as I said, we hitched them up to the chariots, put them onto the plains of Troy. Even the gypsies ended up being the Trojan spear carriers. This is all on YouTube. You can watch it. Um, 
And it was actually, as I said, quite an interesting, to be honest, an interesting moment because we did kind of get an idea of what it would have been like for those extraordinary men in, in that age of heroes to fight and actually how splendid you looked once you were up on a chariot. So we filmed, filmed the chariots, sat down at the end, and to be polite, really, did a little interview with, the, with these uh, men who'd left, uh, lent us or sort of <laughs> hired us uh, their horses. And so I said, um, OK, so you come here to the plains of Troy, to a place called Troia, year in, year out. Do you tell yourselves stories of Troy, of this great war? Do you speak of the Iliad? Total blank. They'd never heard of a place called Troy. They'd never heard of the Iliad. They'd never heard of Homer. So I tried again. So I said, well, OK, well, what about knowing you're quite a sort of macho warrior culture? What do you think of uh, uh, the fantastic Achilles, the great hero, only knowing that the film Troy was out at that time? So Brad Pitt in his leather miniskirt was on all the bus stops uh, in Turkey. So I thought, well, they must have spotted that. I said, you know, what about Achilles? Again, total blank. And then I said, desperate, because of course this is all looking really rubbish, you know, the camera's turning and I'm getting no response. So I said, so Helen, wh what about Helen? What does Helen mean to you? And without exaggeration, immediately their thumbs went up like this and two of the men made this shape with that gesture at the bottom. <laughs> And uh, I have to say, at that point, we needed no interpreter. It was very clear what Helen meant to these illiterate nomadic gypsies. And it was, I have to say, an extraordinary moment, because there I was talking to them. They'd not heard of Homer. They'd not heard of the Trojan War. They'd not heard of the Iliad. But Helen meant something to them. And I found in my research that in both East and West, Helen and actually generally the other heroes of the Trojan War really mean something to people. So, so what is it? How can we explain this extraordinary allure? Um, I wonder if it's actually because Helen does, despite my anxieties about this producer, she does incarnate that combination of, of sex and violence and actually a very Greek idea, uh, the troubling power of desire. This is something that the Greeks talk about a lot and it starts off here right at the beginning of Helen's story with her conception. Um, what you're looking at is actually a Roman copy of a, of a Greek original. Uh, there's one of these if you are from the Argos area that you'll know is in the front of the Argos Museum. And it tells the story of the moment when the Queen of Sparta, Leda, herself supposed to be perfectly beautiful, was bathing herself down on the banks of the fine river Eurotas. And as she was bathing herself, Zeus espied her from above and was so enraptured with her, he had to have her. So he turned himself into a giant swan, flew down and made love to her, and that is what you're seeing uh, represented here. I have to say, call me old-fashioned, but I think it's a slightly odd image to put on tombstones. This is what you're looking at here, a headstone. When I die, I don't want to be remembered by the image of a giant swan uh, making love to a woman, but that's just, that's just me. But it, is a, it actually says something, though. It says something central about the story of the Trojan War and the story of Helen, that what Helen represents is a troubling combination of eros, of love, and Eris strife, because after this union, nine months later, the myth makers tell us there were a uh, leader uh, gave birth to, not to children, but to eggs, and out of these eggs emerged Castor and Pollux and Helen and Clytemnestra. So Eris, the goddess of strife, is always there in the story of the Trojan War, and this is a very rare representation of her. Um, really, really interestingly, the Greek vase painters were very worried about representing Eris because they thought that they would bring bad fortune to their workshops if they did so. so she was very rarely represented. I don't know if you can see, she is really the archetype of all bad fairies you ever get in any fairy tales. There she is with her black wings, with her pointy black boots. She's even got black nail varnish on the ends of her nails. Um, and the story goes that uh, there was a huge wedding. Anybody who was anyone was invited, all the great mortals, all the gods and the goddesses, because Peleus was marrying the nymph 
Thetis. Uh, but somebody had been left off the guest list. Terrible, terrible mistake. We've all got married. We all know we've left one important person off that list. And this person who'd been left off was Eris, the goddess of strife. It's furious. She flies into the wedding, not to be left out, bursts in through the doors. This is, of course, the origins of the Sleeping Beauty uh, myth that, that we, we all tell our children. And she throws down a golden apple as she arrives. A very, it's a very clever little act of destabilisation, this, because she knows that all the goddesses are there, all the most powerful aristocrats, and on this golden apple are written the words, for the fairest. Now, who is going to judge who is the fairest in that room? And Zeus, who always strikes me as a little bit lacking in backbone, I have to say, um, uh, says, I couldn't possibly judge who is the fairest here. I will send my messenger to find the best man for the job. So he sends off Hermes, who goes out actually to Turkey, to Mount Ida, and Hermes there espies a young Trojan prince, Paris. And he says to him, Great news, Zeus has a task for you. You have to choose between the three most powerful goddesses. And there's a rather brilliant vase in the Louvre in Paris, the place, uh, where Paris, the prince, realises that this is an impossible task. And you just see his left leg vanishing off the vase as he runs away. Um, but, but in most versions of the story, uh, Paris stays, and the, the three most potent goddesses come down and try to tempt him to vote for them. Uh, so Athena comes and says, I will give you absolute prowess in war. Hera says, I will give you dominion over the known earth. And Aphrodite, the goddess of love, knowing that Paris at this point is probably a 15-year-old boy, says, I have nothing. We're told she loosens her girdle and flutters her eyelashes. I have nothing for you apart from the most beautiful woman in the world. And uh, Paris makes his choice. He says, I fancy that prize. And Aphrodite, you are the fairest of the goddesses. So now we're on track for the story of Paris and Helen. So Helen, when she's represented, is normally shown as a kind of troublemaking minx. Uh, this is actually a very beautiful fragment uh, from a Greek pot uh, from the early 5th century BC. You will all know, we seem to have, I think, probably about 70% audience of Greeks here, that Greek pottery is normally red on black on, or black on red. And as you can see, this is colour. It's actually purple in the original. Colour on white. So this is a really precious object. And Helen is being used to decorate the, the, the finest of things in the finest of ways, because she might be a troublemaker, but she was still a queen. As you can see, though, a queen with a sulky expression on her face. Uh, this carries on right through to the 19th <laughs> century. Uh, uh, this is painted by Frederick Sandis in 1869. I do quite like this. This is kind of Helen, the, the, the truculent teenager, um, I think. Uh, uh, and it continues through the story of, of Western history, history um, of art. Wherever Helen is represented, it's made clear that, that, that this is one, a woman who's, who's causing difficulties for men. Um, this is, I put these two in because these are both in the National Gallery here in London from the 15th century, from the Italian Renaissance. Uh, this is Helen being abducted by, by Paris. I don't know if you agree, but I've never seen a woman look happier about being abducted there. Um, she's kind of piggyback on the back of Paris, a sweet little smile play, playing about her lips. Um, what you have to remember, of course, interestingly, is that in some of the European traditions, Helen and the Trojans are actually good things because, of course, Aeneas was a Trojan, he leaves and founds Rome. So for those European dynasties that trace themselves back to Roman lineage, uh, uh, it was actually the Trojans were the good guys rather than the Greeks. I'm glad to say that wasn't actually, though, the majority opinion. People have always liked the Greeks. Um, uh, another painting from exactly the same date, uh, 1450, from the Italian Renaissance, uh, although a rather darker image of the abduction of Helen, again in, in the National Gallery in room 52 or 53, I don't know if you agree, this seems to me a very nightmarish image. Um, Helen is there being plucked up by Paris, and there's this strange stillness all around her. Uh, she's reaching out to her courtiers, and they just stand there. There's nothing that they can do. She's kicking with her feet. You can see those petticoats are sort of thrashing out, but she has to go. This is her fate. She has to go to that inky black ocean and to the ship that waits to take her to Troy. Um, interesting, just quickly as an aside, the, the shape of this image. I don't know, do any of you know what that is, that painting? 
Is anybody, have we got any Renaissance experts in the room? It's a very strange thing that, we, we think of this as a painting, a bit of world-class art, but actually um, this is just a bit of painted furniture. This, uh, it's called a Desco da Prato. Uh, it's a birth tray. So, so what it would have been used for originally in the Italian Renaissance is when a high-born woman gave birth, after she'd done that, then on this tray, a painted tray, exactly like this, this, this is one, would be brought the equivalent of the cup of hot, sweet tea. Um, it would be a sort of honey and milk toddy that would be brought to the woman. Um, and again, I've given birth a couple of times, and uh, I would say probably the last thing I'd want to be brought at that moment is a picture of a woman being uh, 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 raped, you know, abducted and taken away. But I think a strange thing was happening. I think those painters and those men who commissioned these, these images were sort of saying, this is the most important story in the world. You have gone through a rite of passage just as Helen did. You've given birth. She was taken. Like Helen, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, where we find a slightly more subtle representation of Helen, interestingly, is when we have um, women telling the story. This is, as I'm sure you can all read, the ancient Greek. Uh, this is a, a fantastic fragment of Sappho's poem number 16. This is actually in the Duke Humphreys uh, Library in Oxford. Um, I won't get you to translate it. I will give you, tell you what it says, but it's a fantastic little thing. There's little, little fragments of papyrus about the size of my, of my fingernail. This dates from the first century AD and was found in the sands of Egypt. And this is what Sappho has to say about Helen. Some say an army of horsemen, some an army on foot, and some a fleet of ships is the loveliest sight on this dark earth. But I say it is whatever you desire. And it's perfectly possible to make this clear to all, for Helen, the woman who by far surpassed all others in her beauty, left her husband, the best of men, and sailed far away to Troy. She didn't spare a single thought for her child nor for her dear parents, but this was not her fault. The goddess of love led her astray to desire. So interestingly, as I said, Sappho doesn't say it's Helen's fault. She says this is all down to Aphrodite. And I think in that poem, Sappho incredibly and cleverly distills not just the story of Helen, but the story of what it is to be a civilized human being. Because I think, and this is something we're going to be talking about later in, our, in her debate, I think that what Sappho is saying here is that as civilized beings, we always desire more. And what we have to try to do is make a balance between that desire representing progress and representing greed, representing the desire of something that really is not ours, that we should not have. And that really is the story of civilization, isn't it? That we raven for more, we yearn for more, but we have to recognize what our own limits are. It's, again, a very Greek idea. We have to know, we have to ask ourselves, is it for the good that we're yearning for more things? Um, uh, the, the young girls of Sparta would have been very uh, disturbed to hear that Helen had been damned by male authors for most of history because, of course, the young girls of Sparta, she is Helen of Sparta rather than Helen of Troy, worshipped Helen ardently and with a passion for 700 years without cease. And we know this because they've left behind these beautiful little objects uh, in their ritual sites in Sparta, up on the hill of Thrapne and down by the river Eurotas. Again, for all the Brits in the audience, Every single one of you, I want to hear at the end of today, you have booked a ticket to go to Greece to visit the extraordinary sites there. Please go to Sparta as well as Athens. I apologise to all the Athenians in the audience, but Sparta does have something to offer, I think. Um, and you can go and see the places where Helen was worshipped by these girls. Passionately, they would race races in her honour. They would dance. This is a girl, I think, not racing but dancing. She's looking backwards. Uh, later authors get very excited and they tell us that these girls, these Spartan girls, oiled one another with olive oil and ate nipple-shaped cakes in Helen's honour. I think that is in their heads rather other than in historical reality. But Helen was worshipped ardently and passionately, both in Greece, in the Greek mainland, and actually right across the eastern Mediterranean. She was also worshipped in Troy itself. Um, again, a female rep image of Helen done by Evelyn de Morgan, one of, one of our um, great pre-Raphaelite artists. I'd like to say that this is a beautiful image of Helen, but I have to say I hate it. Because I think this sort of blonde-haired, rose-dressed, 
wafty chocolate box creature has absolutely nothing to do with both the literary and the historical possibilities of who a Helen could be. Because if you read your Homer, then it's made perfectly clear that Helen is not a woman of substance because just of how she looks. She is a woman of substance because she affects men's activities. She controls what men does. She is a person of extraordinary character. Even Homer, although he has her describe herself as a nasty, scheming bitch, also says, this is a woman of dignity. This is a woman who has real weight. So I don't think that I really don't think that if you showed this image to anybody from the ancient world and said, who is this? I don't think any of them would have said, that's an image of Helen of Troy. Um, I also think, do any of you admit to having seen the terrible movie, Troy? Who's, who watched that? Hands up. Yeah. Oh, Ian Hislop in the middle there. Shame on you. Um, <laughs> But I think, I don't know if you agree, some of the battle scenes were okay. There was that terrible moment where um, they rush in and Achilles is sleeping with two women and they say, you've got to fight. And he says, oh, but I was having a wonderful dream. Homer revolving in his grave at this point. Um, but also what was, for me, so frustrating about it was the representation of Helen, who was this sort of dr pretty but a very drippy creature who dissolved into tears at the, at the least instance. Whereas, as I said, the ancients knew that, that the real Helen had, had fire in her belly. And interestingly, just as an aside, her physical characteristics are not described until the 4th century AD when she's described by Quintus of Smyrna. Up until then, really what was important was what ma Helen made men do. But actually... I think, if anything bears a relation to the truth of the Helen story, to the truth of those archetypes who, are, who I believed lived, the great aristocrats of the Bronze Age, then this really is, is more like them. Because just have a look at this. This is the reality of an image of a Bronze Age woman from about 1600 BC, from the exquisite town of Akrotiri on the volcanic island of Thera, now Santorini, which, as you will probably all know, uh, were collapsed in an extraordinary explosion around 1500 BC, uh, preserving all these beautiful frescoes. And th th this is the reality, if, if you like, um, of the world that those stories of the Trojan War came from. Um, again, I'm just putting this in because I think this is one of the most beautiful objects in the world, uh, created in about 1260 BC in Mycenae. It's a lovely little ivory trio of, of two women with a child just doing that sort of heavy, annoying, lovely childlike thing that they do of leaning on your lap. You can see this in the National Archaeological Museum. Um, and again, Homer, what's very interesting about Homer, if you look at the lines of Homer, every year there's an archaeological dig. Something comes out of the ground which edges those Homeric stories further away from fantasy and slightly closer to fact. Homer was not a historian. I'm not saying that he was doing a verbatim history of the Trojan War, but there is no doubt, we think now, that actually he's relating to the reality of a Bronze Age past. Just one tiny example. Um, Homer describes the walls of Troy as sloping. This is an artist's reconstruction of, uh, of Troy from 1200 BC. The walls were indeed sloping. We also know that Hector and Priam were described as great tamers of horses. And a uh, really unusual number of horse bones have turned up uh, in the Trojan dig. So we think that Troy in the Bronze Age was indeed a center for horse taming and training. So, so when you next read Homer and the Iliad, I would just have half in your head that this is an exquisite work of literature and imagination and fantasy, but it's also, I think, giving us clues to historical truth. Um, the descriptions of women in Homer as well seem to me to fit much more snugly with the archaeological reality of the Bronze Age than with those terrible chocolate box images. This, if you like, is the face that launched a thousand ships. Um, this is from the cult centre at Mycenae, again dating to about 1260 uh, BC. And I think that what Homer has given us when he's talked about the story of the Trojan War, he's given us both images of potent women, of brave, inspiring, tenacious warriors. He's given us stories of journey, of struggle, of survival. And he's also presented us with that great eternal truth. Are we masters of our own fate? Or are we victims of the circumstances around us? And this is something we're going to debate this afternoon. So I'm just going to read you two tiny pieces, and then, and then we're on to the, to the, to the next bit of the afternoon. Um, this is the first time 
that Helen physically appears uh, in the Iliad. It's book three. And she was walking along the ramparts of Troy, and all the old men, were told, started to whisper like cicadas. Look, 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 there she is, they start to say. And catching sight of Helen moving along the ramparts, they murmured to one another, gentle winged words. Who on earth could blame them? Ah, no wonder that the men of Troy and the Argives under arms have suffered years of agony, all for her, for such a woman. She has beauty, terrible beauty, beauty like that of a goddess. So what Homer is saying is that she has a beauty that makes men do things they know they should not do. And I think, as I said, I think in a, in a way in that passage is encapsulated both the struggle and the paradox of history and actually something which is very relevant to modern Greece today. Are, can we determine our own fate or are we victims of some kind of um, greater power or the circumstances around us. I'm going to leave you just with a tiny bit of doggerel. I think we ought to have an English um, view of Helen. This is written by Lord Dunsany in 1938. And I only, I only give this to you uh, because I think we should have Helen's words to finish this session. And this seems to me, again, to somehow get what it was about those extraordinary characters, Homeric characters and characters from the epic cycle, and also, I think, the reality of the extraordinary Bronze Age women who ruled great citadels in the Aegean. And were you pleased, they asked of Helen in hell. Pleased, answered she, when all Troy's towers fell and dead were Priam's sons and lost his throne, and such a war was fought as none had known, and even the gods took part, and all because of me alone? Pleased? I should say I was. Thank you very much. <laughs>
we have, as Bethany kindly said, three living Greek poets. Um, um, you're going to hear from Katerina Iliopoulou, Vasilis Amanastidis, and Dionysus Capsalis. You'll hear first from Katerina. Let me just tell you a little bit about her. Katerina is a poet, an artist, and a translator. In fact, all our poets are translators. And Katerina lives and works in Athens. She's published three volumes of poetry. She's also a distinguished translator uh, from English. She's translated Sylvia Plath, Mina Loy, Robert Haas, and Ted Hughes. Dionysus Capsalis in the middle is also a very, very distinguished translator. He has translated Shakespeare, Coleridge, and Emily Dickinson. He's also written a collection of poems influenced by Cavafy, and he is one of Greece's foremost poets. He's published 17 collections of poetry. And then we have Vasilis Amanatidis, who was born in northern Greece. That's Vasilis here. He was raised in Thessaloniki, and he lives there now. Now, Vasilis actually studied history and archaeology, but then I think he saw the light and became a poet and translator. He's published five collections of poetry, and he is the translator of E.E. E. Cummings, Anne Carson, many others. So we're going to hear some readings, and then we're going to have a little bit of a chat afterwards. Katerina. Katerina Iliopoulou. <laughs> The world we live in is not a completed work, nor a landscape to be looked at, but a field of action. I think of poetry, of my poetry, as a strategy for life. I, I want to invite you to a small journey from Cape Teneron in Greece to New York, then walking through a field that could be anywhere, and finally meeting with a mysterious fox. Cape Teneron is the southernmost tip of continental Greece, a place where ancient Greeks believed was the entrance to the underworld. It is a real place. It does exist on the map. But perhaps in order to truly inhabit a space, one has to also somehow invent it. Teneron. Here the days do not dissolve in the air. They drop into the water, forming their very own layer, a surface of separation. A hawk flies above the body of the summer. It dives again and again, feeding and getting drunk from falling. There is nothing here, only crazy wind and stones and sea, a random promise sharpens our lust with the blade of the moon. When I arrive for the first time in this landscape of endings, the wind entered my mouth with such fury, as if I were its sole receptacle, until all my words disappeared. Every tree receives the wind differently. Some suffer, others resist. I met a palm tree that gave birth to the wind, and distributed it in every direction. Others shake all over and change colors. I, of course, am not a tree. I sat down and wore the wind like a coat. I bent my head and looked at the ground. From its crevices, the roots of time, with their hieroglyphics, struggled to enter the light. Then the words came back. Um, the American poet Mark Strand said that art is the desire for more life. This more does not refer, of course, only to time, but to density within the already lived life of everyone. The next poem on Andre Kertes starts with a line from his diary. On weekend legs, I walked around the town the whole day. I took photographs. The Hungarian photographer Andre Kertes wore out the network of streets of at least three cities with his walking, 
during 30 years. 85 now, confined by grief to his apartment in Fifth Avenue in New York, he photographs whatever is around him with a Polaroid. With the delicate movements of a glass statue, he changes his position in the room. He shifts the focal axis of his gaze. He doesn't need to go anywhere. He says, I forgot to eat. I took photos. I started at daybreak and waited until dusk. I took photos again and again. I forgot my medicine. Two years later, in the book entitled From My Window, you can see the city melting through the window pane. You can see the shadow of a hand menacing a, a shiny doorknob without ever reaching it. A diaphanous glass bust slowly digesting the naked trees of the park and the twin towers above the windowsill. You can see what you don't see. He did come outside again. He photographed the spasm of a little girl running in the park and the half figure of a man in black disappearing. In Paris, he photographed himself double closing his eyes and a crumpled half open white door reflected in the mirror. Every day, he collects the brittle honeyless wasps' nests restless wax catacombs of buzzing. Every evening, he empties them in his bottomless archive. There's no way of stopping this. It's not a place he could escape from. Every formulation, every construction of death is resurrected in the buzzing that seeks still more, more snow, and networks of traces, more mirroring of the shadow on the whitewash, more walking with a strange suspension of joy when he lets the sting prick him again and again. I think that poetry invites us to look at things as if we did not know them. And quite often, this process is reversed. You do not know things, but you let things to come and know you. How to advance in a field. Even though there is no door, we entered somewhere. At once, we came face to face with a process of transformation. Tens of tiny birds, previously invisible, took flight from the ground, touching the tops of the standing crops, thus making them breathe, making them take part in the flight. Every cornstalk, it seemed, gave birth to a bird. At a certain moment they stopped. Not one of them remained. We didn't know yet how to advance with our question pale green in the hand. Had it been a well, we could have cast a stone and waited for the response. Or it might have been enough to seize some elements, plants, a little earth, in order to draw our conclusions. That is to say by an attack or theft. We decided to forget ourselves in our little choreography. Forgetting, just like entering, is a departure. What, what ought we to have left behind? Giant thorns with a saturated orange color turned their heads in the imperceptible air as if they were about to move forward. In the whole place, as we were approaching what we would call center, there was only the sense of beginning. The field, a clenched fist that wouldn't show. The last poem I will read in Greek and English. The Fox. Μέσα στη δέσμη του φωτός εμφανίστηκε 
διέσχισε το δρόμο. Μια μικρή καφέ αλεπού. Και ξανά το επόμενο βράδυ, πίσω από έναν θάμνο φευγαλέα και μια άλλη φορά η ουρά της μόνο σκούπισε το σκοτάδι. Και από τότε πάλι τις πατούσες της να βηματίζουν στο βλέμμα σου. Το ζεστό γούνινο σώμα της ανάμεσά μας να σκυρτά. Πάντα σε πέρασμα, ποτέ σε στάση. «Μα ποια είσαι» τη ρωτήσαμε. «Είμαι» είπε «αυτό που περισσεύει». The fox. In the sheath of light she appeared, crossed the road, a small brown fox. And again the next evening, behind a bush, fleetingly, and another time only her tail swept the darkness, and from then on her paws walking inside your eyes, her warm fairy body quivering between us. Always passing, never stationary. But who are you? we asked. I am, she said, what is always in excess. The, all the translations are uh, done by John O'Kane, whom I'm grateful to. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much to Katarina Ilion. Uh, I will read you poems from a very short sequence uh, of seven poems called uh, Jubilee. And as that may sound familiar to you, I need to give you a few explanations. Now, I, I, last year I felt deeply honored and I suppose a little bemused by the fact that my age uh, coincided with the Queen's Jubilee. I was born 1952. Now that momentous fact uh, did something for me. Uh, at the time I was trying to translate, I was, I was struggling with the translation of A Midsummer Night's Dream and my mind went back about 40 years or so to a girl I knew. Her name was Elizabeth. That was another chance encounter in my dreams. And uh, I thought that was an incredible coincidence. And then all these facts somehow were all did one ball of, of great uh, inspiration and it was bound to explode in lyricism and which no doubt will leave you astounded. <clears throat> now, it so happened also that this young girl, Elizabeth, actually played Titania in a school production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So it all fits well. Triyaz Nol, as our friend Kavafi would say. Now, uh, I will read the Greek to you first, and then the English. Because, as you well know, poetry, according to one definition by Robert Frost, is the sound of meaning. So I will give you the sound and then the meaning. Uh, I'm really grateful to Mika Pravata Carlone. She did a wonderful job trying to translate the poems. Uh, they, in Greek, as you will hear, they are in fact uh, rhymed, uh, the trimeter couplets, uh, iambic couplets. And, of course, it's very, very difficult to translate, even though in Greek they sound very simple. They all have, at the beginning, sort of a very short phrase uh, from another poem. The little uh, things I, I try to put into the poems uh, discreetly, so they sort of resonate through them. Uh, they're all actually references to other poets. The first one, which is very simple, Life is Sweet, is, of course, for those of you who are Greek, a reference to Solomos, and it goes like this in Greek. Και ρηγούν οι κλόνοι σε περιβόλη που αναρώνει. Και να γυρνά εδώ που γέρνει χλωρό απόγευμα και φέρνει δροσιά με λύπη και συμπόνια. Μα πώ να πει 60 χρόνια. 
Second one. Now this one may sound familiar to you. The little phrase is from Edmund Spencer, Sweet Thames Run Softly. Πάντα η αλήθεια είναι μισή. Γλυκά κυλούν στο τάμεση μπάντες από τις προκυμαίες, μαούνες, γόνδολες, σημαίες, αυτοκρατορική αρμάδα. Σαν μέσα από μια χαραμάδα, όπως του τείχου στο όνειρο, είδα να βγαίνει από το νερό μια Ελισάβετ χρόνια πριν, μετά το Help και το Αλίν, μια τρυφερή αυτοκρατορία χωρίς επέτειο και ιστορία, 1968, θέμου σαν ένα φιλιτό. Truth is always half true. On the Thames flow sweetly bands from the Keys, tugboats, gondolas and banners, an emperor's armada. As through a chink, like walls in the dream, I saw emerging from the water in Elizabeth many years ago, after help, and later than Aline, a tender green empire with no anniversary or history, 1968. God, it has the weight of a sob. The third one has a motto in French, a la tour aboli, that's from a famous sonnet by Nerval. 1968, χαμένος, κυριολεκτό, στις θάλασσες της εφηβείας, ενήμερος κάπως της βίας των άθλιων συνταγματαρχών και μεταγωνικών ευχών διασχίζω τον Ατλαντικό με ένα θαμπό ιδανικό για μια υπεροκειάνια, κυριολεκτό, Τιτάνια. Ήμουν ο Φίβος, ο Μπυρόν, ο Λουζινιάν, ο Όμπερον ή στον ήρωο μου φίλησα μια νεραίδο βασίλισσα. 1968, lost, I mean it literally, in the seas of adolescence, informed vaguely about the violence of the roguish colonels, and full of parental blessings, I crossed the Atlantic with one blurred ideal for a transatlantic, I mean it literally, Titania. Was I Phoebus, Biron, Lusignan, Oberon, or did I kiss a fairy queen in what was but a dream? How are we doing about time? Doing all right? Okay. Number five, I skipped number four, so we have the time to finish. It's called Halfway, and uh, it's a cryptic reference to Kavafi, a wonderful poem about a room in the afternoon where the sun reached the bed halfway. 1968, σε ένα αυτοκίνητο ανοιχτό, το ραδιόφωνο να παίζει «Hey Jude» μπορεί και «Purple Haze» και μύριζε φθινόπορο. Έτσι έμαθα να αργοπορώ, να αφήνω με μέσα στη μνήμη ένα χαμόγελο, μια κνήμη, μια κάμαρα κλειστή, το φως εκείνου του απογεύματος, όπως σηκώνει μια ψηφίδα από το χώμα, μια πατρίδα από το χρυσάφι που χρωστώ και από γυαλί χρωματιστό. 1968 in an open convertible and with the radio playing Hey Jude or perhaps Purple Haze, smelling of autumn. This is how I learned to idle, to surrender myself to memory, a smile, a shin, a closed room, the light of that afternoon. Just as you pick up a tesserae from the ground, a homeland from the gold that I owe and from a bit of colored glass. That also is a reference to Kavafi for those who may remember. Number six has a line from The Dream, one of Puck's lines, Lord, what fools these mortals be. Βρισκόμαστε στη Νέα Υόρκη και ομοιοκαταληκτούν οι όρκοι νοτίως προς τη Βαλτιμόρη. Ένα κορίτσι και ένα γόρι παίζουν ανώδυνα το φύλλο με το κυρτό και με το κύλο σε τέλεια εφαρμογή. Μα ο παράδεισος αργεί, δεν επιστρέφει με το στίχο. Γυρεύει μια ρογμή στον τοίχο όπως εκείνο το όνειρο που μια φορά και έναν καιρό σε σχολική παράσταση έλαμψε σαν Ανάσταση. We are in New York, the promises rhyming southwards towards Baltimore. 
but not in English, the rhyme in Greek. A girl and a boy <laughs> toy insouciantly with gender, with a convex and a concave in a perfect fit. Yet paradise is running late. It does not return along with a verse. It seeks a chink in the wall, like the one in the dream, which once upon a time in a school play shone like a resurrection. Crisis, even in Greece, has brought a question. No one ever asked what the intellectuals have to say about something, or what do they say when we were not living in a crisis. But now we are living in a crisis, even in the Greek press, everybody asks us, asks intellectuals or poets, what do we think? So this is dangerous as well, because artists are not there to give solutions or to give answers. They are there to make the questions or to make the new questions or to make the questions, the old ones, new. Hi. In Greek, the word poetry, piece, comes from the verb pio, which means make, to make something. So, poetry is a rather extensive territory. I wrote many poems about creatures, animals, plants, humans, that they cannot realize or refuse to realize that cosmogonies happen around them, that things always change. These creatures try very hard to stay the same. They are in denial. And this aspect makes them half comical, half tragic, in a way that maybe combines Beckett with Disney. <laughs> so, let's read some of them. Of course, these are not the actual poems. They are the translations of the poems, and we, ha yeah, we have to keep that in mind. But they are very good translations, and this is very touching in a way, because, you know, translation, I have written there, is to imitate your illusion of the authenticity of the other. So... <laughs> so, this, is, this was translated by a very good friend of mine, Yanis Gumas, and all the other poems are translated by Sakis Kiradzis, who is a very good friend of mine, and he must be in the audience right now, maybe with my friend Yanis Tavoris, although I don't see them. <laughs> <coughs> they are building new honeycombs. One cannot help noticing that when bees burn, they become soft like red velvet, brittle, as the naked pupils of blue eyes, and then die. Before comes the fire that melts the honeycombs, and the ascension of the beehive's last dreams, last dreams, last dreams, last dreams, last dreams. In fact, for a moment, there is a slight commotion in the air. Then they vaporize. And since bees' dreams smell of flowers, for a long time after, will the next beehive search in vain on high for a garden. Incident with strawberries thereafter. It's cold, he said. He died. Let's say it again. It's cold. It was hot, actually, summertime. He said, he died. And yet he comes, we talk again. But he's dead, how is it possible? As if he didn't recognize me. I've always loved strawberries, he says. I say, should I bring you some? He says, yes, thank you, kind sir. I pretend I didn't hear. Here you go, nice and red. Do you want sugar? I say, should I put them in the fridge to make them crusty? He says, I prefer them fresh, fresh and warm. I say, do as you please, suit yourself. He tries, but I can't, he says. What a shame, I can't eat strawberries. My mouth won't open anymore. Maybe I won't after all, kind sir, I won't take any, thank you. I say, 
What's with all this polite nonsense now that you're dead? I don't care about the strawberries. Don't do it again, please. Shame, because for a long time, I've been saving him fresh strawberries. Mm. Now, uh, another poem. I'm going to read the first uh, lines in, in Greek. Ti pota ospu ani ligo kialo ke ligo akomi kialo akomi ospu lu lu di ospu klini ligo kialo ke pio poli ma kialo li ma kialo ligo ospu ti pota. So the translation. <laughs> And the title, <laughs> first, The Life of a Flower Shot on Tape or Multiple Resurrection. Nothing until it opens slightly more, slightly more, even more until flower, until it closes slightly more, and even more, slightly more, slightly more, until nothing. And now, the crucial note. I touch your hand, I guide it to the remote control, and together we press rewind. On the screen, the rose, in resurrection, fast backward. We play, we press play, fast forward. On the screen, the rose leaves fast and then it dies. I won't let go of your hand. We pray, we press immediately rewind. You say, will we never give up on this resurrection? I won't let go of your hand. We press play, fast forward, forever rewind. I say, no, my love, never, never on this resurrection. Do I have time? Oh, yeah. I like the way they look at me and ask. With <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Aha. An almost clinical case and a theorem. I believe that Dimitri accumulated so much sorrow since 13. <laughs> that now in his 30s, Whenever he hears something funny, small, half, even stiff, bursts rampaging in sort of retrospective laughter of, of sudden joy. Ha, 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 ha. That shakes the rooms, immobilizes amphitheaters, brings down the walls of cafes, explodes mosquitoes in the Amazon, and breaks the barrier of sound towards the broader, outer, galactic space. <laughs> what it is I say, we are always directly scarred by a constant and indelible consonant H, around which a startled and undecided between happiness and pain, A, ah, continuously revolves like a dazed little fly. And the last one, which for me, although I didn't write it for that occasion, seems to correspond to what's happening in Greece right now. The canyon, or the invention of sadness. Forever in the canyon, where not a house nowhere, the one thing always all over, snow. Soft, very warm for us, as far as the end of the canyon. Not from above. Never from heaven the flakes. Not one, none. Then whence the snow? From deep below within the earth. Like an unwilting sprout from a root of white. Snow swelling underground. And upon it, us, constant, 
perpetual, recurrent, contented. Because in our possessional language, devoid of verbs. Because utterly unneeded. Because never an action between us ever. Since between us nothing with nothing for nothing to nothing. Thankfully. Hence, rather unperturbed and unsuspecting and untouchable. Like so. Upon the snow growing, suddenly, a single soul shape, wandering footprints, phosphorescent and then evanescent. Oh, beautiful sudden red light, overturn of figure shape, immersion in snow, disappearance, appearance of, an, of another. Another similar shape, wandering and growing alone. Appearance of other similar, simultaneous, and others, yet, oh, sudden beautiful red lights, Overturning of figure shapes, immersion in snow, disappearance of some, others remaining, appearance of new similar, and others yet. Since here, no night, never. Only a time for each one different, of sleeping. And then a time for each one different, of waking. Because around us and before us, no adversary, thankfully, since on the canyon only us the constant who constantly, old and new present with even pace to and from, and thus always around us and never like always, were called no more. Blessed. Oh, blessed life. Thank you very much. Vasilis. Amaratides, thank you very much indeed. And just very quick, you mentioned the Karaitis. Um, we know here in Britain that not enough Greek poetry is published, written, translated. What about now in Greece? How are you getting your poems published? Are there festivals? Are there still bookshops running? I mean, how is it? I'm not sure. Maybe Katerina is most responsible for that. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Uh, we have a kind of language, you know, which is not very uh, often in people. <laughs> we are Greek. So, some of our poetry is translated in other languages, in situations like this or others. But usually, anyway, we Greek do not read poetry. Yeah, we don't. Katarina. I think that uh, I think that this is um, a more general uh, situation in contemporary world. Like uh, poetry is written by many and read by few. Yeah. So I don't think I don't think it is a Greek Thank you, thing. This is, yeah, this is the way. Yeah. It is true. It is. Uh, uh, one characteristic of, of our times, because there is an abundance of production of, of art, generally, not only poetry, and uh, we, we seek for the audience for, the, for, for, the, for this art. Dionysus, do you have readings like this and festivals and so on where you go and read your poetry? Well, there are many festivals, mm -hmm. yeah. It's around the country. That's still, yes. that's still going on, yes. and they're still being funded. Well, more or less. I mean, you know, they... They don't need a lot of funding, you know. You just go there and read. Um, That's good. <laughs> yes. So you, you don't mind not getting paid? <laughs> just checking. No, no. I, 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 I've, I've never been paid to read poetry. I mean, that... Not in Greece, no. That will be the day. Um, also not here a lot of the time, either. <laughs> except, except for your, uh, your thing here. <laughs> <Is> it? <laughs> it's not a lot. For which it's we are a grateful. Gesture. It's well, a it's, gesture. Well, it's more than we've ever received, I think. Uh, so uh, thank you very no, much. That's not fair. On, I have to I have to uh, say something to um, uh, <coughs> on what Dionysi said uh, that um, maybe explains a little bit the situation that uh, in Greece there was never I enough funding for the arts, especially for literature. It was very it was minimal, maybe nothing. So I have to say that we are we are trained in a, in a culture of overcoming of trans. Uh, and we are trained to do things by ourselves, not to expect to be helped by, by the state or the institutions. I mean, institutions are good, and it's good to have them, but uh, there are other ways to do things, and poetry doesn't stop, art doesn't stop. Of course, you know, people are 
active and and there is uh, I think there is an abundance of, of poetry written in, in in Greece today and there are many uh, besides the problems there are there are many presentations recitings uh, discussions I mean public ones so well, it's wonderful to have you here today it really is so thank you very much Vasilis Amalitidis Dionysus thank Kapsalis you. and Karina Elopoulou thank you, thank you. crisis happened, I discovered that what I have already written till now was in a way what we or me lived in a country that was in inertia, in a country that was immobile, it was trying to keep the things stable. I al I've always written about creatures that do not want to change their status. They are there. They're afraid of life. They're afraid, afraid of the outside world. They prefer to stay their place, like Beckettian figures maybe, but in a more comical way, my way of writing them. So, when the crisis happened, I discovered that these kind of creatures have already ended in me. I don't have anything to say now about creatures that are living in inertia. I'm trying to say something about creatures that are trying to move towards somewhere. <laughs>